this afternoon's session. It's one of our two breakout sessions. In case you're planning to be at the digital engagement presentation breakout session, you're in the wrong room. That's room 204. If you're here for creative intelligence, you're in the right room, which is a sign that you're creatively intelligent. So uh, welcome to room 203. And I'm going to just uh, turn it over to Arnab, and he's a colleague down the hall at, in our labs, a member of research staff, Arnab Roy, and he'll be the moderator. And he will have the great task of introducing his fellow panelists, and we'll take it from here. But if you do have any questions, uh, any, any questions, let me know. Um, I think uh, throughout the session, you'll probably take charge of the, did, were you planning to make it interactive, Arnab, or just wait till after each presentation? Yeah, wait for after on the presentation. Okay, that's a good point. But there will be interactiveness here, uh, just uh, when the timing's right. Um, and we'll have microphones uh, for you to speak uh, into to make sure everybody can hear your questions. And that's about it. Without further ado, Arnab, take it over. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Welcome, everyone, to the panel on creative intelligence. So today's panel, we have various experts on machine learning, and they are going to touch on various aspects of machine learning today. So for most of you know what machine learning is, but just to recall, machine learning explores the study and construction of algorithms which learn from and predict on data. There are two broad categories that our panel is going to touch on today. Uh, supervised learning. Supervised learning is where you have a training set where there is a set of training data with output values given, and your objective is to predict the output values on unknown data. Uh, the other class of algorithms is called unsupervised. Uh, there is no well-defined output in those cases, and what the machine learning alg algorithm wants to learn is structures and patterns in the data. So what will we learn from our panel, panel today? Broadly, three topics. There has been tremendous advancements in academic knowledge of machine learning in the past decade. Can we translate this success to industrial settings? How do we make things modular, more easy, and seamless to integrate into industrial environments? Second topic is, as data and communication increases, security and privacy are becoming ever more concerning. So can we? do stuff with big data and machine learning. So turn this around and learn from data to increase our security and privacy. And the third topic is that machine learning is becoming so ubiquitous now. You see examples of machine learning everywhere. But can it still surprise us? Are there use cases of machine learning that we haven't thought about? So without further ado, let me just welcome to you our audience, and our esteemed panelists, we have Joshua Blue, who is going to talk about Wise.io, his company, machine learning for customer success. Then we have Dr. Hiroshi Suda, who is a project director, and he's going to talk about behavior analysis technology for human-centric security. And then we have our researcher at Fujitsu Labs of America, Ramya Srinivasan, who's going to talk about did the machine just learn that? And I'm going to be your clueless moderator. Uh, I'm Arnab. I'm a researcher at Fujitsu Labs of America. And ideally, I want to sit back and relax today. If you do your job, I won't have to do mine. So I hope I don't have to do anything today. And you'll make it very attractive after all the talks are over. But if not, I'll take over. OK. Thank you very much. And let me welcome. Professor Joshua Bloom to the podium. Uh, professor Bloom is the CTO of Wise.io. He's also a professor at UC Berkeley, where he teaches, of all things, astrophysics and Python for data science. Joshua holds a PhD from Caltech and has degrees from Harvard and Cambridge. Welcome, Joshua. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Hope everyone can hear me in the back. Um, so in the brief time that I have today, I wanted to talk very broadly about machine learning in production. 
um, not as a retrospective tool, uh, the way that we've been traditionally thinking about business intelligence, but as a living, working, breathing, assistive tool that um, drives and uh, provides real value to, to businesses. Um, in the customer success space where Wise.io uh, works, we see the human-to-human -human interaction as a ripe interaction point for where uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence more broadly um, can have a very big uh, impact. Uh, so very briefly, and it's not my intention to uh, pitch you on the company, but I thought it might be helpful to get some background. Um, we uh, are trying to plug into um, systems of record uh, in the CRM space, um, and there's a bunch of reasons to do that. Um, but what we can do is uh, sort of provide an intelligence layer on top of the interactions that people have been having with their um, customers. So if you think about the ways in which you might provide automation in a world before machine learning, you might think about building and curating business rules. Um, but instead, if you let a machine um, understand what's happened in the past so it can make predictions um, into the future, uh, then you're essentially asking the machine to infer uh, what those very complex rules are and to curate them as time goes on, providing uh, the ability to continually learn as you wind up getting feedback. So if you make a prediction and it doesn't come true and you make a mistake, um, making sure that you have a system which is capable of continually learning um, and updating itself uh, and get better over time is one of the, the big challenges. Um, so we integrate into things like a Salesforce um, or a Zendesk, and one of the reasons why that's attractive for us, um, obviously there's a lot of data in that space, but we don't think of ourselves as a big data company doing a lot of natural language processing, and when you're more or less just um, sticking to text-based interactions, there's not all that much data that's available in a, in a company-wide um, uh, basis. But we're typically working at very high transactional volumes of a few million um, cases uh, per month is the way to think about uh, where the machine learning that we do winds up shining. Um, so this is a, a generalized workflow for the type of machine learning uh, that you heard uh, at the beginning, um, something called a supervised learning. And that's where you're learning from past data. If you look at the top swim lane, um, you have a bunch of incoming data. It can be unstructured. It can be text-based. It can be images. It can be voice. Um, you do uh, what a lot of data scientists spend most of their time on, which is uh, what's called feature extraction and feature engineering. Um, and then you throw it into the uh, machine learning algorithms. Um, and once you've done that enough times, and you have the ability to optimize that entire uh, uh, parameter space of what it takes to get a good model, the hope is that you just seamlessly put that into production and it just starts working. Um, but I, uh, I, skip, I skipped over some of these important points here in this uh, very complex flow diagram. Um, the, the real important point is that when most people talk about machine learning as academics, they're really focused on just that top right corner in the model development. So they're trying to say, you know, my scaling curve is slightly better than your scaling curve. I get a slightly better accuracy on the same toy data set um, as somebody else. There's obviously tremendous value in that. Um, but the recognition that there needs to be uh, a full sort of systems uh, of view approach to putting machine learning in production helps you understand with this complex diagram that there are a lot of pieces of this puzzle um, that are uh, traditionally not um, thought about in the, in the academic literature, but are vastly uh, more important when you start thinking about software engineering. I, I mentioned machine learning as an optimization. Uh, we are always trying to optimize something. You're trying to optimize, in the case of a support ticket, the average handle time or a customer satisfaction. Um, but again, when you think uh, uh, very deeply about the models that you're building, oftentimes the types of optimizations you're doing there are not directly correlated with the, um, the business outcomes that you're looking for. And so oftentimes, I, I, for those that are practitioners, this might be a bit of a scary diagram to explain all the different pieces of uh, what it takes to get machine learning in production, but it's obviously much more than just the algorithms. Um, it's obviously you have to build something that is maintainable and understandable by the people uh, around it. And then ultimately you have to build something that has um, business value. And again, that feedback loop is, um, is critical. One of the things that we think a lot about um, in at WISE and I think is becoming one of the more interesting topics in machine learning in general is um, that human-machine interface. Uh, rather than ask machines to make uh, decisions for everybody and to completely remove people from some transactional loop. One of the things that's very interesting is at what point does a, a machine provide assistance, 
to people who then basically take actions based on, on what a machine said. And at what point does a machine gain so much confidence in what it believes to be the answer that it should just take it um, directly? And so one of the interesting things is as you bring machine learning uh, into production environments is you also have to bring some level of change and change management into organizations so that they can understand that you're not completely re uh, replacing entire workflows and, and all the people that are part of that workflow, but instead are, are living alongside those workflows and as confidence is gained on, in both the algorithmic sense and then also um, on the, in the softer sense, only then can you start sort of cranking the dial as you go from T0 to T1 to T2 to T3. Um, and it's really where you uh, uh, provide those uh, dividing lines that becomes a very important question. And any good machine learning system in production will be able to um, help its consumers understand where those dividing lines um, actually live. A part of that, of course, is understanding the risk tolerance. So for instance, just coming back to the support case, um, if somebody writes an email and says, um, you know, how, how do I reset my password? And you send back a, a, an automated reply that's the best that's inferred of, here's how you do it, then the customer's happy. If you say, well, thank you for your feedback, the customer may say, that's kind of weird. That's not what I asked for. And they, they might come back to you. And so the risk of being wrong there is not a big deal. But if a customer emails you and says, uh, I had a problem with your product, and you know, my house got set on fire, I'm suing you, um, please contact me and my lawyers, you probably don't want to send back an automated response. So inferring when you know um, what the uh, potential consequences are, both in a positive sense and a negative sense, is absolutely critical in understanding how to put these systems into production environments. And part of that is, as we get closer and closer to the human uh, interface, is giving the human the belief and the ability to give feedback into the system. So the classic example now is Gmail, where uh, it may categorize um, your message into, say, travel or personal uh, or spam. It gives you the chance to understand why it made that prediction. We said it was spam because it looks like other spam we've seen. Um, and also, it gives you the chance to say, no, that you're, you're actually wrong. I'm actually going to engage in that message and that, and that thread so that the system under the hood can continually learn without, without people having to um, you know, sort of tell it to, uh, to, do, to uh, relearn. Um, I, I won't go through all the different details, but it should be clear that more and more in our own lives, both in business and in our personal lives, we're interacting with machine learning systems, whether we know it or not. And if you start thinking about the different places where this could be useful, um, you wind up starting broadening out machine learning not as a tool for uh, even just business people, but for, for those that are our consumers um, to get the best out of data. Yeah, um, just, just uh, two more slides here. Um, as data science teams are thinking about building out uh, products into their, uh, into their core business, there's a bewildering amount of platforms that are available. And on the two axes that I've plotted here, and this is completely subjective, there's uh, uh, probably someone will get mad at me if they actually look exactly where they are relative to others, but um, you have the notion of what's production ready at the top, all the way down to sort of what's experimental, what's a great sort of sandbox for, for prototyping. And then on the left, you think of something as a service, potentially hosted in the cloud, and then something that's completely on-prem. And these are sort of the decision places as you're starting to buy and think about building software into your own systems where you want to un un understand where you lie. But oftentimes people don't think about those other axes, about the time it takes to implement one of these systems um, and the cost it, it is to, to maintain them. So in the interest of time, um, what I'll just do is um, summarize and say that in some sense the, f the, the first wave of, um, of uh, software as a service is to take what had been in an on-prem environment and put it into the cloud. And largely that's already done and obviously in a multi-tenancy uh, kind of way. The next wave is to build systems of intelligence on top of that. And again, rather than think about replacing people in transactional, uh, you know, real-time workflows, think about where machine learning can be a, an assistive tool to help drive um, efficiency um, and automation. I'll leave some of my other conclusions up there while we, while we switch over. Thank you. Thanks, Joshua. Next, uh, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Hiroshi Suda. He's the project director for privacy and data security project at Fujitsu Labs Limited. He received his undergrad degrees, MS and PhD degrees from the University of Tokyo. Thank you, suda -san.
Hello, I'm Hiroshi Suda from Street Love uh, from Japan. I'm leading privacy and data security project. Today, my talk is about uh, human-centric aspect of security. At first, uh, I'd like to show how we are vulnerable, how we are dangerous. Yes, this, this chart say, uh, says uh, most of the data leak are done by human. For example, oh, do you? Oh, yes. uh, human error and inside of, uh, inside of fraud, malicious insider, and targeted attack. <coughs> the first uh, step of the targeted attack is by targeted email. Uh, and as you can see, uh, human is the most serious uh, security. Uh, <coughs> yes. Yes, this is a lesson from behavior of Fujitsu employees. Uh, we developed a tool uh, called Sealed Mail Checker. It is a tool for uh, preventing missending email. Uh, this tool asks the user uh, to check uh, the suspicious missending email, and the user uh, can bring back uh, the email if it is wrong. This is the bring back rate and time series. And uh, it is very interesting. There are two uh, dangerous hours uh, at night. Of course, uh, we are very tired. And now, what time is it now? Around 2 o'clock? Uh, from 1 to uh, 3 p.m. This is also another uh, dangerous time. Maybe you can guess uh, this time, uh, hours, uh, we are very, very sleepy after lunch. Uh, they are careless time. <laughs> and uh, this is output of a simulated training of targeted email. And uh, average rate is about 10% or so. But look at uh, this department and this department. Uh, the open rate is completely different, six times different. What the, uh, yes, from uh, these lessons, uh, we think that uh, uniform security uh, policy control is useless. We have to uh, develop a flexible uh, security policy control system. We have to change security policy by human uh, organization and situation. Okay. How to do that? Uh, we have to consider two kinds of risk. First is the potential risk of user or organization. Uh, and second is the dynamic risk, such as receiving uh, targeted email like that. Uh, we combine three kinds of technologies. Uh, first is uh, user behavior capturing, and second is uh, psychological uh, analysis, and uh, third is uh, machine learning anomaly detection. By, co by combining these uh, technologies, we can uh, provide a proactive security measure for to cope with cyber attack and uh, malicious insider. Okay, uh, if we have uh, time, please go to the demonstration room and uh, try security risk assessment demonstration. Uh, this demonstration, you have, oh, sorry. Uh, you have only to uh, answer several questions and you can get your risk. Uh, or uh, virus infection and in fraud and an intentional data leak. Yes, uh, okay. One thing we have to consider uh, in using uh, behavior data is the privacy. We investigated, uh, we, we investigated how this technology is access acceptable uh, at uh, Fujitsu Forum Munich last year. Uh, I guess uh, in Europe, uh, privacy is very, very severe rather than uh, compared with uh, United States or Japan. Uh, but even in uh, EU, most of the person accept this kind of technology using uh, users' behavior data. 
for example, uh, reading email or reading web access or keyboard input or mouse movement. And, uh, and some of them uh, accept it if anonymized, or uh, some of them uh, accept it if used in local PC, not shared by your boss. <laughs> okay. Yes, last uh, month uh, we oh, press released this kind of technology. Uh, yes, detection of back and forth tar type targeted email attack by uh, user's behavior sequence uh, analysis and uh, anomaly detection. Yes, one thing we have to consider is that uh, this kind of research, uh, for example, uh, machine learning approach in security, uh, it, it is often uh, used, unsupervised learning methods are often used because uh, targeting email, uh, malicious insider, they, they are very, very rare cases. We don't have enough supervised data. So uh, we have to use uh, this kind of learning method, but uh, one of the point of unsupervised learning is uh, high false positive rate. How to uh, reduce uh, this rate? We uh, combine users' behavior data, for example, uh, get an email and return and open the second email and open link, and uh, in the back of the uh, Internet Explorer, redir it is redirect and download malware. Yes. We link uh, these different uh, log information by users' PC, PC operation uh, pattern. Okay, I'll skip. Uh, yes, by combining statistical analysis and dynamic analysis, we uh, demonstrate this kind of data. Yes, in summary, human-centric aspects are very, very important. And secondary, uh, three kinds of data, user behavior capturing and psychological statistical analysis and machine learning analysis, combination of these uh, technologies is very important. And privacy is also a big problem. And uh, also we, maybe anab is doing a very good work in related with uh, relational encryption. This kind of uh, privacy preserving technology is also they're very uh, important for privacy. Uh, date handling. Thank you. Thank you, Sudasan. Next, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Ramya Srinivasan, who researches machine learning, computer vision, and data mining for various healthcare services and platforms at Fujitsu Labs of America. She obtained a PhD in computer vision. Let's welcome Dr. Srinivasan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as we have been witnessing, machine learning has provided a wealth of promising opportunities for several AI applications. Uh, so, be it in things such as online shopping, virtual assistants, self-driving cars, almost every aspect of our present day life has been encompassed by some form of machine learning or other. While most of these things may seem obvious, what I'm going to talk next is not that very obvious. These are rather unconventional use cases of machine learning, which might even pleasantly surprise us. That's because one perhaps couldn't have imagined machines to do these tasks. What exactly I'm talking about? Here are a few illustrations to that point. The first one uh, here is IBM's Chef Wax, which can come up with novel and creative recipes, taking into account food ingredients, chemical compositions, preferences of the user, and so on. This is an example of a visual field guide for understanding bird similarity. For example, for a layman, it is difficult to distinguish between a black bird and a crow. But using fine-grained visual categorization techniques, it's possible to come up with such a similarity tree. And it can be used for much bigger causes, such as environmental conservation, and so on. This is an example of what is uh, computational creativity. This is a poetic machine which can come up with automatic uh, rhyming lines, and not just that, but semantically meaningful lines whenever user inputs a text. This is an example of computer vision algorithm that can identify when a scene is funny, when it is not, 
without knowing anything about the socio-cultural context, which is often very crucial even for humans to judge whether something is humorous or not. These are just few examples of many such unconventional use cases of machine learning that's there, but perhaps we are not aware of those. Uh, now I would like to just talk a little more about one such application in detail that was uh, part of my earlier research. I call this computational aesthetics. It has something to do with face recognition in portraits. Now the first question anyone can get when they look at this title is, why do we need to do face recognition in portraits? The answer is the following. Now portraits were a very powerful source of media way back in the Renaissance period, that's roughly late 15th century to early 19th century in Western Europe, and they were used for a wide variety of commemorative reasons for understanding something about the dynasty, to convey an aura of power, beauty, and so on. Uh, they encompass a wide range of media like sculptures, death masks, paintings, mosaics, to name a few. Unfortunately, a large number of these portraits have lost identities of the subjects that they represent. Art historians have some lingering ambiguities. So they don't know who this person is, and they suspect it could be this person, but they don't have any clear evidence. And it is here that computerized face recognition technologies can provide an independent and quantifiable source of evidence to art historians in answering some of their open questions. Okay, so what's different about it? Or rather, what's difficult about this? After all, face recognition is pretty well advanced. Uh, to answer that, now, apart from the typical challenges involved in any face recognition system, such as variations in pose, illumination, facial expression, age, and so on, there are additional constraints to this particular application. Now, a photograph is very much like the realistic representation of the person it represents, but a portrait is subject to the visual interpretation of the artist. For instance, these are images of the same person, portraits of the same person, Lorenzo, who was an aristocrat in the Renaissance time, but by different artists. This was a sculpture, this was his death mask, painting, mosaic, and so on. As you can see, it is very hard uh, for us to say that it is indeed the same person. So a good, robust face recognition system should be able to separate out this style from the content, the content being the sitter that it represents. The second big constraint to this application is data sparsity. Uh, while a typical face recognition algorithm can enjoy the luxury of having ample training instances from which it can learn the facial features of a particular person, here we don't enjoy that because a large number of these portraits have been ruined and not all of them are well authenticated. So because of these reasons, we cannot just employ any off-the-shelf machine learning algorithm to solve this task. So how do we solve it? Without going into great details, I'll just give a quick overview. Um, so this is also a supervised learning system. So it has two stages, therefore training and identification. During training, whatever is known to represent a certain sitter, that is the art historians uh, provided to us a set of images where the identity of sitter was known beyond doubt. Now using those, we learned certain discriminative features uh, that are not only characteristic of a particular sitter, but also of an artist. For example, uh, if Da Vinci had a particular style of portraying the eyes in his portraits, this algorithm is capable of recognizing that. Not just that, it can also rank these features in the order of their importance. For example, if the eye corners was most important than, say, mouth tips, and that was more important than ear corners for Da Vinci, this algorithm can actually rank those features in the order of their importance for every artist in the data set. So we used a set of local features, which are salient fiducial points on the face. Uh, these could be things like uh, eye corners, nose tips, ear corners, and so on. And also a set of salient anthropometric distances, such as distance between iris, and so on. And using those as features, we computed similarity between pairs of portraits. So if the portrait represented same person, we call it a match score, otherwise it's a non-match score. So wherever the artist is known, we use the artist specific features the algorithm has learned. Otherwise we use this entire set of features to get these distributions of match and non-match scores, which we collectively call as the portrait feature space. Now when we want to understand the identity of an unknown sitter, for example, this is an image of Galileo, and this is an unknown image. Uh, it was a 1590 painting provided to us by, an Itali uh, by a private collection in Italy. So art historians suspected that it was Galileo. And using statistical hypothesis tests on this portrait feature space, uh, we found out that with very high probability, this indeed is Galileo. 
thus making it the earliest known portrait of Galileo till date. So like this, many other interesting results were there. Uh, I'll just conclude with a slide that shows some of these results. Thank you. So at this point, I would like to invite the audience with come up with questions. Yes, please. What is the uh, accuracy present in your case? 90% accurate, 20% accurate? How accurate is your method? Oh, so that we can comment only on the training data because the identification is an open question. So this is only providing a complementary source of evidence to the article. On the training data, after a follow-up validation, uh, the accuracy was more than Um, yes, Dr. Suda. Yes. In your presentation, you mentioned um, that you'd come up with conclusions about what levels of privacy were acceptable. Was that just on a survey of certain people? Maybe you did a bit, tell a bit more about how you came up with those um, conclusions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, that's very Question here. Uh, I was a bit late, but just anyway, I just want to ask that: Are these libraries available in open source, or are they licensed? And uh, if you would like to use this for, let's say, edge computing, for face recognition, etc., will it be available? And what's the model for using it? Thank you. Put it this way, in open source, we always look for APIs available for any library that can be consumed by any edge applications, example. So like in edge computing, we do uh, AR, VR, augmented reality, virtual reality, and we always look for fingers, the face recognition, those kinds of things, to position that in a particular map to say they are moving here, there, and those kinds of applications. So if we have to use this, is this an open source library based, or is it simply database, simply training database? It's offline, and then you use after, once you have used that, then you can put the API separately. Dr. Suda, um, I'm a security researcher, so I was very interested in your talk. And um, the second user behavior is one thing that you're collecting. And the second one, if I remember correctly, was a psychological aspect of it. How do you collect that in the number, you know, first place? And um, you already mentioned that you, some of the user behaviors being used, and I looked at the pie chart, and to me, the sample size was rather small. I'll be honest with you, it was just 11. <laughs> so it wasn't really uh, representative in my mind. And so I'll be interested in seeing broader study and how that is really, you know, whether reflective of general population or not. And I tend to stand on the extreme side of it. I don't like it, but um, nevertheless, I use it for the convenience of it. So um, 
So this uh, user behavior, how do you collect it? How do you mingle that with your research? I'm just curious. Um, There's a question for all three of you. Maybe you can comment. Um, I think in your first talk you alluded to that um, to some degree. Um, machine learning, of course, gives us some automation of uh, automatically identifying some of the important features. But humans still, the modelers, have a huge task typically in um, many of the algorithms. I was wondering how much in each of your work humans, the modelers, the machine learning experts, how much time they spend in massaging the models up front and how close we are towards more you know, of a hands-off where you can give this to a layperson who does know nothing about statistics or models and so on and, and just unleash it on, say, images like this and, and have it do some, something sensible with it.
we have uh, a lot of things to do here with respect to obesity and vitamin, but at least not in terms of keeping the current system. So they have their own plans for the obesity and vitamin. Okay, uh, I had a question. Um, so since there are, uh, I see there are lots and lots of machine learning algorithms that are there. Uh, and for a lay person, it's you know, difficult to know like what is their ordering relationships. Is there some kind of trade-off for certain problem domains where you can trade off the complexity of the algorithm and how long it takes versus the quality of results that you would get and how that ties into whether it would be worth it to go that route or use a sort of much simpler algorithm with you know less computational resources. Uh, anyone? So, yeah, again, I think that's a great question. Um, there are lots of different axes that one needs to optimize on, and um, I think you've hinted at an important one, which is in some sense the time to learn given a sort of level of accuracy that you need for that specific problem. There are plenty of examples where if you have low dimensionality of the data, a linear model will work just fine. Um, there are other extreme examples where if you have hundreds of thousands of input dimensions, uh, linear models will do, will do terribly in an accuracy sense, um, but because they can be trained in parallel, you might be able to get a very quick answer. So typically what you're looking for is a trade-off between accuracy um, and time, uh, but there's other interesting axes that um, some uh, researchers focus on, like total memory usage, because if you get that down as well, it allows you to train on a, on a, on a smaller machine without needing to go to full sort of uh, multi-machine parallelism. But I think one really interesting new place of research that is only just now getting addressed is trying to find algorithms that are interpretable, uh, in part because, again, we're talking about putting machine learning into a production environment with real sort of business users on the, on the end of it. And if you view machine learning as a black box from the end user perspective, um, it's very hard to consume the, the answers. So um, I suspect for all of our cases, uh, there's, a, there's a level of, well, why did you give me the answer that you, you, you got? Because I need to internalize it and, and actually believe it. <coughs> so in the case of deep learning, one of the big knocks against that as a general class of algorithms is that it's not very interpretable. Um, it's very hard to understand why you predicted that it was this. Um, there are other types of algorithms, again, on the, fully on the linear side, where you say, well, I have a bunch of weights, and I know I learned what those weights are, so when I have input data, I know exactly why I got the answer that I got. And somewhere in between that, there's going to be the trade-offs that you're gonna have to wind up making. My general rule of thumb when it comes to which algorithms you look at is that there's really only a few that um, are working well for most types of data. And uh, deep learning works incredibly well when you have a massive sort of petascale or terascale of data at, at, at best. Um, and most of us, though, are not working at the Google scale of images um, or, or lots of training data. So we need to find things that work well and learn well with smaller amounts of data. And there's, there's a couple of algorithms we call fully augmented, which one of those are. Um, but in the end, I don't think you have to uh, sort of look through a very broad universe of hundreds of different algorithms. There's only going to be a few that basically perform very well across broad classes. important in this domain, rather uh, Bayesian algorithm is more important for what we can do now. That is a trust, uh, not trust, uh, <coughs> the, bigger, the bigger data is not so <laughs> good, uh, but uh, trusting a real uh, user uh, the behavior uh, in certain uh, Bayesian tools uh, will be get tool to uh, provide user uh, certain data. Uh, this time, the difference of data in uh, sources is more important. So it's not that different of data, but it's still the tool of uh, certain algorithms can be used, uh, whether it's you know, separable mark or sourcing to predict a set of algorithms uh, that you're searching for. For example, in my case, with a lot of data quantity, uh, there is no way to employ uh, a searchable algorithm that is so optimistically dark. You can, deep learning is only applicable for large scale data, for images, and all that. So I think the size, I mean, the choice of algorithm is largely data-driven. 
there's a, there's a famous quote um, uh, by Peter Norvig, who's like brutal, who said, and I might get it slightly wrong, so don't, don't uh, hold me to it. He said, um, uh, more, d more data beats clever algorithms, but better data beats more data. <laughs> Any of you working with or any comments on IBM Watson? IBM Watson. Any comments or working with IBM Watson? So what's your take on uh, DeepMind's approach on beating Go and uh, how to address real-time challenge without sacrificing scalability for machine learning? Uh, the second question, how, how, how do you address real-time challenge without sac sacrificing scalability for machine learning? But I have a quick comment on what, what's, uh, what you addressed on this uh, uh, Go, Go challenge. I think, you know, for chess, IBM was addressing it by a brute force searching because the search space is limited. Yep. Now for Go, 
it's impossible to be honest at a modern age right now. So is there a similar solution which uh, how long we gonna take to beat as a grandmaster of human being, not necessarily the exact optimal solution, you know? It looks like time has flown by. It's 2.30 now. So I'm going to ask each one of the panelists to give their concluding thoughts. Well, we were um, uh, brought here to think about uh, creative intelligence and creative machine intelligence. And um, we, we saw uh, a, a very nice place where uh, we could learn about artistic uh, interpretation. Um, but we didn't really touch upon what it means for a machine to be um, uh, the good news is, for those that are worried about that world where machines are more creative than us, of course we're always in a world where machines are helping us automate, um, is that I think of a creative process as a, as a directed one. When um, you know we saw early on the, the possibility of having poems that are auto-generated, and we're looking now auto-generated music and auto-generated uh, pictures that are pleasing, um, if, if you remember the fact that a machine doesn't know what it's doing, but it's instead been set up by somebody else uh, to do something that could be pleasing. I think we're very far uh, away from a machine being self-aware to know that it should be creative. Um, so that's my the bigger picture <laughs> statement. Uh, yes, uh, it is true. Uh, it's not bigger design. It is true, it's a system concept. So you have to consider security as a part of system. And system include network and hardware and network system and middleware and application and also humans. So uh, that's why I use every instrument as a system. And secondly, uh, yes, machine learning 
is very interesting. But uh, I think we'd like to combine machine learning and strategic regarding security with the randomization uh, uh, encryption. Uh, one of the encryption techniques of the homo encryption. Uh, it be the next key technology. Let's thank the speakers and uh, thanks to you. <laughs> Certainly, I had an easy job because of all the great participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thanks, Arnav. Sure.